For reference, I'm a female in my late 20s, and about a week ago, I had an unsettling encounter. The city I live in is surrounded by reserved land set aside by the city planners, which is a forest of pine trees. I usually walk my dogs up in the area closest to me, which is about a 10 minute walk from the middle of town. It's one of my favorite places to go to, but now I'm really nervous about going in the area alone. The city is usually very safe, and I've never had any concerns out by myself, even in the dark, and I've been in the forest when it's dark many times with no incident. The track where I access the forest is at the top of a dead-end street, through a park with a playground, and up a long series of steps. It's quite secluded. I have two dogs, an older one and a one-year-old. They're a working breed, so very high energy although the older one is now arthritic and doesn't need much exercise, but the younger one needs a huge amount of off-leash exercise daily, which is why I was out on this particular evening. The older dog is also very shy and has a nervous disposition. It was after work in the winter, so the sun had just gone down. It was also bad weather, nearly a storm and raining, although the trees shelter you from most of the rain. I get into the forest and I let my dogs off of the leash. We met a couple of other people also with high energy dogs along the way. As I was walking along one of the tracks, my dogs were up ahead running up and down the banks at the sides of the track and I noticed up ahead there was a man sitting on a seat. I could see that he was dressed in dark blue track pants and a leather jacket over a hooded jersey, head down staring at the ground. His hood was up and I couldn't see his face. He was just sitting there in the rain and I immediately got bad vibes from him. I try to shake it off as just someone out for a walk, but I decide to stay alert just in case. A few minutes later, the older dog looked back at something behind me and then just bolted, clearly spooked, running in the direction of the playground. I'd never seen her run away like that before and the younger dog ran right after her. I yelled for her to come back, but she was gone. The younger one comes back when I called, but keeps running up ahead and back like he can't decide who to go with. That's when I look behind me, and I see the same man a little bit further behind me. I start to get really nervous about the weird man, but more about my dog who's now run away from me. The track I am on makes a large loop before ending back at the playground, but the track below led straight back so I quickly climb down the bank onto the lower track and start hurrying after my dog. Not running because I have a ruined back, but walking as fast as I can. The track is muddy and slippery, so it's slow going. By this time, it's gotten pretty dark out. When I get near to the steps, I see both dogs just sitting there, and they come running up, very excited to see me. Relieved, I turn around, and the man is right behind me. He had to have run or followed me down the bank to get there so quickly. I realized that I really need to get back to a populated area, and I head down the steps as fast as my back will let me. When I get to the bottom of the steps, I put the dogs back on the leash, and the younger dog starts growling for the first time in his life. I glance back. The man is now halfway down the steps, and when he sees me, he suddenly stops and proceeds to tie his shoes. I keep looking at him with my dog still growling. He shoots me a long, angry look, then turns around and walks back up the steps into the darkness of the forest. Nothing bad actually happened, but it really got my adrenaline pumping, and I can only guess what might have happened if I didn't have my dogs with me. At least the younger one, because the older one was absolutely useless with protection. I'm just really glad nothing actually happened. Last summer, I was camping with my partner and our 30-pound dog along a creek in a popular area in a nearby national forest. It was an established site, but not a campground. It had a parking spot, fire ring, and a nice flat area with access to the creek. Dead of night, we were woken up by a large truck parked by a car, just idling. Eventually, three men get out of the car. They enter our camp. They're talking quietly, and the truck in the creek makes us unable to hear what they're saying. 
I'm pretty sure it's not good. Meanwhile, our dog has been growling lowly the whole time. Early on, I whispered to my partner to be quiet, hold the dog, and hide. I got out of our sleeping bag and I put my shoes on. The only thing that I had for defense was a forest axe, halfway between hatchet and axe. Very useful for getting by in the woods. It had a leather sheath with a metal button latch to protect the blade. They took their time, perhaps as intimidation. I loudly popped the metal button from the latch, taking the sheath off, preparing to use the axe if need be. All three of them heard the latch. My assumption is they thought it was a gun holster, quickly left the camp, and then got in their truck and left without a word. So yeah, to those creepy guys who showed up to our camp to do God knows what in the middle of the night. I'm really glad to have not met you, and I hope I never do. So, this happened to a couple of friends and me about six years ago. It was the first summer we were all back from college. We were being hooligan kids who had each gotten into weed a little bit in college. We decided to go to the state park near my one friend's house late at night and smoke. For the sake of the story, I'll give a bit of layout. We parked at the end of this dead end on a wooden road where a path started that led into the park from the back. This park is heavily wooded with a lake and some recreational areas on the side with the main entrance. The path we were on went parallel to the edge of a large field with a couple of yards of trees in between. A little ways down there was a small gap to access the field. We had stopped in the big field next to the tree line near the gap that led back to the path that we walked in on. There was a rock there and my one friend began to use it to prepare the fun stuff. It was a really cloudy night and the only things that we could see were what we lit up with our phones. After a couple of minutes, we hear something moving in the trees down a bit further, maybe 30 feet-ish away. I've always been overly paranoid and instantly went to the worst, but my friends figured it was just a squirrel. A minute later, we hear it again, now closer and louder. I begin to say, Sounds kinda heavy. You think it's a deer? More to calm myself down. Hmm, maybe. One of them says, that's when the sound began to pick up. We all froze and put away our lights. We had all grown up in wooded areas and spent a lot of time hiking and whatever else. We know what it sounds like when someone is walking in the woods, or at least what it might sound like. If it was a person that were walking slowly still, but were way closer than I'd have preferred. That's what really got me too. What animal would walk towards people? I got a surge of anxiety and kinda blurted out. It sounds like a person. Right on cue, whoever it was starts running right at us through the trees and one of my friends yells out for us to run. And we do. We started running at full speed across the field of tall grass and the entire time we hear the guy running behind us. A minute of running brought us to a tall rock dam and we began to climb, furiously tripping and scrambling over the rocks on the other side and run into the woods that ran next to the road that we had parked on. We got a little ways in and sat together in the dark, absolutely still and silent. We don't hear anything but don't break our silence or move a muscle for about a half an hour. We then creep through to the edge of the road, unfortunately a ways past my friend's car. After about five more minutes of building the courage, we ran to it, waited for my friend to unlock his door so we could unlock the back one, and got the heck out of there. However, when my friend began to back up his car, his headlights lit a little ways into the path in front of us. We caught a shadowed figure of somebody walking right down the path. It had to have been that guy, but I'm just glad we got out of there when we did. Who knows what could have happened. So, a few months ago, I was out hiking with my friend. We live in the mountains of Western Maryland and we were about six miles into an eight mile loop that we have done frequently when we decided to take some pictures and eat a snack at a summit. This area of the trail had a park, benches and tables, and a parking lot. We were sitting and talking, and I noticed a man just walking around the parking lot all alone. He was walking aimlessly and staring at his feet. 
What confused me was that he was in jeans and a button-down shirt. Not exactly the right attire for hiking. We decide to set off on the last two-mile leg of the loop. This part goes downhill to the headquarters of the park and is cut out of the mountain slash bank. The end of that leg is the parking lot where our car is. You don't have a lot of visibility from the trail and you have to walk in a single file. I was walking in front and talking to my friend. I turn to look at her and I see the same man right behind her following at a rudely close distance. I immediately got a gut-wrenching feeling. I noticed that he didn't have any pack or hiking gear and was not even wearing boots. Something about his eyes really spooked me. So a bit more walking and he continues to fall very close. I say to my friend that I have to tie my shoe as a reason to step off the trail and let him pass us, in case he's only following close because he wants to go faster than we are. She immediately catches on to what I'm doing and we pull over. He looks startled and she says hello politely. He just stares. This is when I notice that he's carrying a stick. As I'm fiddling with my shoe, she stands between us and he passes us. We wait to give him some distance ahead of us, but he immediately slows down. We wait for a bit longer, and he gets to the furthest part of the trail that has slight lines to us, and he turns around, looking up right at us. We decided that something feels too wrong about this guy, and we don't want to have to pass him a second time. So we turn around and walk back up the trail towards the park with the tables and parking. A few minutes of walking up the trail, I look back and I see him walking up the trail as well. He's following us. I tell my friend to walk faster. We book it up the trail and get to the parking lot area we were at before. We start to strategize and wait, deciding that we will wait to see if he comes back up the trail to the lot. There's more people around this area, so we felt more safer waiting it out. About 20 minutes go by and nothing. We are talking about how that could mean that he kept going on the trail and is long gone, or is now waiting on the trail where it is more deserted. We see a couple come up from the trail from where we were, presumably taking the loop in the opposite direction that we are. We approach them and ask if they saw anyone on the trail between this lot and the next. They tell us they saw a young man sitting on a rock about halfway down. They describe the man who was following us. We explain our interaction with him to the wife and we begin to get into a conversation back and forth about whether or not he was a threat. The husband finally interjects and then says, We need to call a ranger. He wasn't just sitting there. He had a knife and was carving that stick. Needless to say, we called a ranger. The nice couple walked that last leg with us to make sure we got to our car safely, and then even gave us their numbers in case we needed anything. The rangers then walked the trail, but there was no sign of him. I really wish I knew where he went and what happened to him but I'm glad to know that my instincts are legitimate. Years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would often go longboarding at night, as my friends and I were quite the night owls. We loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the roads or the paths we frequented. Even when using main roads, it would be very rare to see a car out so late in such a rural area and you could always see and hear them coming from very far away due to their headlights and the noise of the vehicle disrupting the peaceful silence of the night. We were really into it at the time, and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not arriving home until the sun was up. One particular night, we decided to ride a few miles away from our usual back roads to take one of our favorite hidden routes. It began with a narrow paved path that was the only piece of land separating two sides of a long lake. It would often seek under due to rain and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long and was extremely relaxing to ride through due to the scenery. After making it to the end of the lake, we decided to continue moving and turn into a very close path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we came up to the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny moving ball of dim light down there. 
It moved so strangely, and it was extremely difficult to make out what exactly it was. Rather than shine our flashlight down, we curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to each other about what it could possibly be. All at once, that small light turned into multiple blinding light and extremely loud revving sounds, overwhelming our senses that had become accustomed to the dark and silence. Acting purely on fear, we instantly turned around and ran as fast as we could, hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off path into a very dark, very overgrown hole to the side of a hill, overlooking where we had just come from. We decided to hide in the natural dugout of this hill, hoping the plants in the darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening out there. We watched our pursuers ride up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four-wheelers and two on full-size motorcycles. They were yelling at each other about something, but we couldn't make out what they were saying due to the distance we had covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other and speculated who these people could be. Our first thought was that maybe they were park rangers of some kind. Although we had never seen one here in the many times we had been through, and honestly we doubted that this country had the budget or even the desire to have anyone patrol the deep woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely inappropriate for the paved bike trails, and they were very angry about something. They began to call out to us for a while, yelling things like, We know you're out there, and we can see you. Come on out. We stayed silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we clearly heard one of the men yell out loud, Find them now, and then smash a bottle. That single moment had erased any hope that we had that these were just park rangers doing their job. We watched them split up, each one of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path we came from. It took us what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in fear inside the dugout, watching the lights from the vehicles travel through the woods and paths. One of them already coming full circle and passing the point where he started from. I thought about calling for help, but I was too afraid to open my phone in fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the lights of the vehicles to reach their farthest distance yet, we finally summoned the nerve to get up and try to run somewhere far enough from these people to safely make a call. We ran as hard and as fast as we could through the woods. Since their headlights gave away their location on these paths, we would hide again whenever we felt they were getting too close. Our available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the woods became less dense, and the fear I felt waiting for them to drive past us while basically only being covered in leaves and plants may still be unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the woods onto the intersection of the two main roads, far from where we started. We dug down into the ditch to call for help. When I opened my phone, I noticed I had recent missed calls from one of our other friends, Connor, who we were supposed to meet up with after our longboard excursion. I then called him and frantically asked where he was. Luck was with us again. He hadn't given up on our plans despite us ignoring him and was only a few miles away, already heading in our direction. I gave him the names of the two streets we were near the corner of and explained that we needed to be picked up right away. He agreed to speed over to us while Justin and I waited in hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did. We bolted in the backseat of his car yelling for him to get out of there, and he took off. Relief doesn't begin to describe what I felt being safely driven home that night after everything I had just experienced. After explaining everything that happened to Connor, we ended up just moving on with our night and decided to not call the police. We figured they would be gone by the time any officer made it out there, and that would only be putting ourselves at risk by admitting to breaking the law by taking those paths so late at night. I still have no idea what happened or who those people were, I've been told all kinds of theories from friends and family that have heard this story, but I still don't really know. Justin and I later admitted to each other that when the revving started and we couldn't see, both of our minds began to think about a chainsaw. So I suppose it could have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought we saw that night that made them want to catch us so badly, we never actually saw. I guess we'll never really know what was actually going on there and I'm not sure if I even want to.
I've had the misfortune of coming across a few scary guys in my life. My friends will say I'm a weirdo magnet, so I'm pretty wary and clued up now that I'm a bit older. But when I was a teenager, I suppose you could say I was very naive. Back when I was 20, my family and I, my mom and my little sister, had moved from a small rural village in the Shires to a town down south. It was a big change, and as I had been having a bit of a hard time, I welcomed the change of scenery. It was a really beautiful town in an affluent part of the country, but I struggled to find a job and became very frustrated as my mom needed a bit of help with money. Over the course of about three months, we became fairly friendly with a middle-aged guy who owned a takeaway shop in town. Let's call him Phil. If he ever saw us doing some shopping, he would always come and chat and ask how the family was, and he genuinely seems like a decent and caring guy. So, when he said that he might have a job for me in a shop with a small flat upstairs that I could rent for next to nothing, I thought, okay, great, maybe things are looking up for me. Phil got our address, and he told me and my mom that he would pop by early evening when he had finished and take me to the car to go see the flat. I get myself looking, f I get myself looking fairly casual but presentable, and I'm feeling excited and confident now, thinking, wow, I got a job and a flat. I've killed two birds with one stone here. I just need to show him I'm sophisticated and I will make a great employee. Around 8 p.m. he knocks on the front door and my mom answers. He tells her we'll probably only be gone for about a half an hour and he'll have me back safe and sound in no time. Now I didn't take my phone with me as I didn't have any credit to call out with and I didn't think I would be needing it for a quick trip up to the road and back. In hindsight, it was a pretty stupid thing to do. Maybe if I had my phone on me, it would have deterred him from what he was about to do. So, it's already dark out as it's March. I get into his car and we start driving and he's chatting away, asking how I am and telling me what the flat is like, when within a matter of a few minutes, I've noticed that we're not taking the conventional route that usually takes us directly into town. At first, I think he's just taking me down some sort of shortcut around the town to get to it. And I begin to reason with myself that he probably knows the area better than I do, so I try not to question it. Around 30 seconds later, I begin to realize that he's taking me in the complete opposite direction to where we were going. And I can tell that we're driving away from the populated town and into an area with nothing but trees and swamp on both sides of the road. My brain is now working overtime, thinking, where the heck is this guy taking me? And I just about manage to keep my composure, and I ask him outright. Where are we going? Town's back the other way. I just thought I would take you on a little tour. It's beautiful here. Many forests and peaceful places I would love to show you. He tells me in his normal cheery tone. I wasn't capable of saying anything in that moment because the logical and reasoning sides of my brain were in full-blown war. I'm trying to keep calm and thinking to myself, okay, he seems fairly normal. Why wouldn't he want to show me around? I mean, it is a stunning area full of natural beauty. He's probably just really proud to show me where he lives. The logical side, however, disagreed, and a wave of panic came over me. A little voice enters my head and begins to shout how stupid I am and that I need to get out of this situation. So I just sit there in silence, taking in the scenery which is becoming more sinister by the second, because at that moment in time I didn't know what to think of all this. All I know is every cell in my body is screaming at me to find a way out of this situation. I started looking for signposts, houses, any distinctive landmarks, ditches, huge trees, anything that I would be able to use to recognize my way back if I had to bolt from his car. Phil can obviously sense that I'm really nervous, so he's just talking away at me about what the job's like and how his staff are really friendly. And before I know it, he's slowed down to a crawl, and he's turned onto a little dirt road with a dense tree line on one side and pitch black open fields on the other. My stomach literally drops and my body contemplates power vomiting all over his car because the reality of what is about to potentially happen hits me like a freight train. I begin thinking to myself, if I jump out here, I have to be able to run over muddy fields into literally nowhere. But my imagination starts flashing images of him grabbing me before I get a chance out the door. So I just sit there buckled in the passenger seat, not saying a word. I begin to think to myself that if he attacks me, don't make a sound. Don't give him the satisfaction of showing him I'm scared. My brain wasn't very useful at this point, and I was starting to get angry with myself for not doing something, but I was just way too scared. 
We come out at the top of this little dirt road, and there is a tiny little car park surrounded by woodland with one car sat in it. It was clear there were people in there having sex, and as he pulls near the car I realize he has brought me to a local dogging spot. He then turns to me and puts his hand on my knee, and then says, We should do what they're doing, with a deadly serious expression on his face. I make this really bizarre half-nervous laugh, half-garbled high-pitched whine and try to laugh off the suggestion to show I'm not into it and that I'm super uncomfortable right now. The alarmed expression on his face at my gurgled cackle which sounds like I've swallowed an entire potato clearly freaks him out, and I'm mentally congratulating myself for my socially awkward and grossly unsexy reaction. Hey, it will be fun. No one will see us. He persists. No, I don't want to. Plus, I'm kind of seeing someone right now. I lie, but he just sits there smiling at me with a creepy smile like I'm going to miraculously change my mind at the sight of his weird face. My mom will be expecting me home now any minute. I tell him while trying not to make eye contact. I'm sure she won't mind you being out a bit longer with me. You can trust me. He tells me with a straight face as we sit next to the sex wagon parked next to us. I sharply pull my leg away from his grip, and I tell him again. My mom is waiting for me. She will start panicking if I'm not home within the next few minutes. Take me home. I look him straight in the face, and he knows that I'm not messing around now. Okay, that's fine. I'll take you back now. Without another word, he drives me out of that creepy seedy place and back home. My finger is hovering over the seatbelt ready to jump out. As we pull up outside our home, I breathe a sigh of relief as I can see my safety literally a few feet away, and before it can stop me, I run out and I slam the door right behind me. As I'm stepping over a tiny little rope fence around our garden, he gets out of the car and my heart sinks. I think I'll pop in to see your mom real quick. He tells me, and I swear I can see a smirk all over his face, but I know he's only doing this because he's freaking out, knowing dang well I'm going to tell her. He was trying to delay the inevitable, or scare me into keeping my mouth shut. Before I can try and talk him out of it, my mom heard us pull up and open the front door. I barge right past her with one thought on my mind. I head straight into the kitchen, grab a small knife out of the drawer, and fly into my little sister's room like a mad woman. Don't you dare freaking leave this room no matter what you hear. I tell her. Seeing the knife I am stuffing up my sleeve, she just looks at me with panic in her eyes and says back, Okay. I walk back into the living room and the cheeky twat is now sat on the sofa sprawled out comfortable as crap like he's at home. I begin to see red like, swear to god, I felt like I was the Hulk. I'm totally ready for him. I awkwardly perch myself on the arm of the sofa that my mom is sitting on, the absolute furthest away from him I can manage, and he's just sitting there making small talk with my mom, all the while keeping his beady little weasel eyes on my every move. Why don't you come over here and sit over next to me? He pats on the sofa cushion next to him. No, I'm alright over here, but thanks. I tell him as I'm fidgeting with my sleeve trying to stop the little knife from falling out in front of him. Why are you sat over there? Come, come here, honestly I won't bite. He laughs and pats on the seat next to him yet again. No, really, I'm quite comfortable here. Thank you very much. This time through gritted teeth. My poor mom, bless her heart, is looking at each of us during this back and forth like a tennis match, and I can see something is registering her eyes. She can see my behavior is all off. I'm half stood, half sat down, and I'm fiddling about with my sleeve. I'm twitchy as crap and staring my mom in the face very intensely, mentally trying to speak to her through the power of telepathy alone. In that moment, I must have looked insane. Well, it's getting late now, so I think you should go. She finally speaks. My mom is starting to look anxious now as she's finally figured out that something has happened and that something went wrong that night. Phil gets up and agrees and mumbles about having to check something at his shop when he walks by me and is nearly out of the room when he pauses and turns to me and then puts his hand to shake mine. I'm thinking to myself, what a freaking weird thing to do. I take the opportunity to kindly offer him my hand that had the knife. Taking it with a bit more force than is polite, he soon yanked his grubby mitt out of mine when the tip of the blade had jabbed him. He looked down and saw the blade and then right back at me. I gave him a look with such disgust. Phil hightailed it out of our home so fast without another word. I told my mom everything and she was fuming. 
We did discuss going to the police, but there wasn't really a crime aside from him being a major creep. Sadly, when I mentioned to a couple of girls around my age who lived down our street, they all clammed up and shot each other a strange look. I guessed he probably had done this type of thing before to other girls as well. Not too long after that incident, we decided to move away from that area. I'm so glad to report that I've never seen that smug face of his ever again. Thank God. I'd like to begin by describing myself because I believe it's relevant to the story. I'm a 25-year-old male and a bit above average height. I've been doing sports five to six times a week since I've graduated high school. Gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sport my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I've just recently purchased a new pair of high-altitude mountaineering boots because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that's surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break in my boots last Saturday, more specifically because it would have been my granddad's birthday, and he also loved hiking before he died. These boots were pretty overkill for these woods, but I needed to try them out. I selected a nice route that's around 25 kilometers and set off at about 9 in the morning. It had rained just the day before, so I expected a fair amount of mud and not so many people as they're usually easily scared off by the weather. Since the summer was excruciatingly hot, it was a nice change of temperature especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not so distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike, but she's turning 14 this year and she doesn't enjoy long distant walks anymore. My girlfriend had to do something for work on short notice, so I knew from the moment I woke up I would be doing this hike all alone. The first half of the hike was perfect. The altitude difference along the trail was minimal. I barely broke a sweat and I misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met at most six to seven people during the first two to three hours, and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animal tracks. Between 12 and 1, the path ran into an actual road, one where cars can go. This road is asphalt but deep in the forest and can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go here. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred meters. As I was walking along the road, I hear a car approach from behind me. It went past me, but not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older green SUV with a fresh registration. You can tell by the license plate. Probably an import. Anyway, I thought nothing of it at the time, but then I heard it come back. It drove past me for now the second time, now very slowly. I could clearly see two men sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had stubble slash beard game going on as well. I assumed that they were gamekeepers even though those cars have a crest on the hood and on both front doors as well. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things. I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this. They have jeeps which are far more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort and again, I thought nothing of it. Then my trail left the asphalt road and I began snaking in the woods again. I walked ahead serenely, gazing at the trees and whatnot. Then I suddenly had the strange sensation that something or someone was behind me. There was an engine sound that was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point the trail was quite narrow but if for whatever reason you'd want to drive a car on it, you could just about. Now, when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically in my face now. It was an arm's length away from me, and it stopped just as I had. I looked at the driver who was staring back. I calmly asked him, What's wrong, shall I let you go? In a polite tone as his window was rolled down. He didn't speak. He slowly started reversing, and he soon disappeared behind a curve. Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that, unlike earlier, now he was alone in the car. I listened intently, standing still, since I wasn't sure what was going on. So at this point I wasn't scared, but there was definitely a faint feeling of unease in the air, 
and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car stop just behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but nothing from that point on. I now turned around and began walking towards my destination at a much faster pace than before. Now I was getting scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer, and why he just reversed and left without saying a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it, and I had no desire to ask him again, or to see him again for that matter. I had just walked enough for the unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water as I usually do, I decided to take a leak. I saw a perfect spot to do so. A very narrow path off my trail that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder that led up it, and began peeing. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I had been camping there for a good few minutes before I headed back at the trail from where I deviated to take a leak. Right before I arrived back to the main trail, I began to think to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind, no noise of any kind. Absolutely nothing. This made me realize just a moment later how alone I truly was. Except for the man who was standing maybe 50 meters away from me on the trail in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back on that trail, since the small one to the tower was hidden by trees and you couldn't see the main trail as it was running perpendicularly to the small one. I looked at him, and I was instantly chilled to the bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing with a baseball hat on. The only reason he was standing still, I believe, was a moment of surprise that I had appeared from a place where he didn't expect me to appear from. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident of the SUV, I would have probably walked along the trail not thinking much of it other than he's a hunter. However, in light of the strange encounter with the SUV from which the second man was missing, something inside me instantly snapped. In hindsight, I'd also like to add that it's illegal to hunt in these woods this time of the year. I figured in the matter of two seconds that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion towards and past the tower, as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf or the others, he'll just think I'm an idiot and forget about me in two minutes. If I'm right though, it's the best call I will have ever made. And for Christ's sake, he began running towards me. Adrenaline blossoming within me, I began sprinting away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees, and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was completely exhausted. If I had to guess, it must have been several kilometers. I even crossed some smaller trails but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was a billion the whole time. I began checking my phone for a signal but nothing. I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate. After a while I began power walking but still, off trail straight ahead in a direction that I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone finally got a signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me seriously. They said I was overreacting and whatnot. Well, I'll let you decide for yourselves if I did or not. Finally, I reached a trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this large forest. It felt like eternity, but I walked the last kilometer to the main square, took off my jumper, and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to a station near my car, rather anxiously. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in, and then drove home. My dog welcomed me back like I was coming home from a two-year deployment. Dogs are just amazing. She must have felt that something shook me up. I spent the whole afternoon contemplating my life in the bathtub. My new boots destroyed my feet, but they aren't meant to be sprinted in for large periods of time. At least I broke them in. I decided to call the forest gamekeeper's office. I inquired about whether they have such cars in service as the one I came across. They do not. Their gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're usually alone. I told them my story and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me the police wouldn't. No one could have been legally hunting in the area during summer either. I've been reading local news, but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet.
I really hope nothing else happens. I'm a 24 year old female. I live with my sister at the first floor of a three floor building with a big garden surrounded by a fence and a gate. The other two families in my building are cool, but the neighbors are honestly the worst people ever. The landlord has already told the neighbors to not let their kids play ball and jump over the fence to pick the ball in our garden. They've destroyed flowers, fruits, and the fence. The parents don't care and they just always use the excuse that they're just kids and they won't pay for the destroyed fence. Lately, my sister caught one of the kids, around 12 to 17 years old, peeping through our bathroom window. Fortunately, he couldn't see much because of the curtains inside, but he tried. We tried to talk to the neighbors, but surprise, surprise, they said they don't understand and they only speak Turkish. How convenient. Anyways, I caught the teenage kid staring through the window the second time and I called the cops. They took 40 minutes to come and they didn't seem to want to help us at all. They told us since there wasn't any damage on our property and he didn't try to force entry, there was really nothing they could do. Our landlord said she had already called the cops before, but they didn't care either. My sister and I also noticed that some socks and tank tops magically disappeared from our clothesline outside. Creepy kids. My boyfriend gave us a collapsible baton, two folding knives, and two pepper sprays. We never leave home without either the knife or the spray. This experience still shakes me up to this day. I'm still not exactly sure what happened. I live in a very safe neighborhood which makes this even creepier because it just goes to show you never know what lies beneath. My nephew was about 5 years old. I was asked to babysit him for the night. I was young and at the time I didn't really know much about how to watch a kid. So I figured I'd just put on Netflix for a few hours. We went to the kids section on Netflix and started watching some show about talking cars. This was about 5 p.m. so it was sunlight out. Perpendicular to the couch is a sliding glass door. The curtain for the door was wide open. I was sitting on the couch with my nephew as we were watching TV together. My nephew really liked the show so we continued watching it. This went on for a few hours until it was dark outside. In my foolishness, I turned on some lights but I never did shut that curtain. It was one of those things where other people can see in, but all you see from inside is the blackness of the night. My backyard is adjacent to a big field, so there's no street lights out there or anything. Suddenly I hear the sound of one of the deck chairs being dragged across the deck. I instantly recognized this sound and just assumed it was my parents. Why they would come home silently and then go outside to move around the deck furniture in the middle of the night is something I really didn't think about. Like I said, it's a safe neighborhood. We watched TV for maybe an hour until it was bedtime. When I brought my nephew to bed, I realized my parents had been home and I asked them who was out on the deck. Both of them denied ever going out on the deck. Very creeped out now, I went to the kitchen and turned on the deck light. From the window, I could see the deck chair had been dragged from its usual spot at the outside table, about 5 to 10 feet away to the sliding glass door. The chair was directly facing the window, less than a foot away from the glass, right in front of the opening in the curtains. From where it was, the person would have had a perfect view of me and my nephew. The chair was positioned like someone had just pulled it up and taken a seat, like we were the show and they were the audience. I never noticed anyone outside the window or felt like I was being watched. Well, it gets creepier. The very next day, I found two big handprints with the fingers spread all out on my bedroom window. My bedroom window is on the first floor. Luckily, the room used to be my brother's and he had some problems with girls sneaking in, so my parents installed some pretty good locks to the point where the window couldn't be opened at all. To this day, I have no idea what happened. It's been several years with no other signs of Peeping Tom since. Safe to say, this incident shook me to my core. I don't leave curtains open at night anymore, and neither should anyone else.
So, I grew up in a very small town where security wasn't much of a priority. At the time this began, however, my dad was on the road as a trucker, and my mom was very adamant about locking the doors. We lived in a two-story older home, and the bottom level has one spare room, a garage, and my childhood room. My room was kind of underground, which means the windows led directly out to the ground level of our home. I would frequently use these to sneak out of the house and party as I got older, but I digress. When I got to the age of around 10 years old, I began feeling really scared of kidnappers. I would frequently play the hide under the covers and they can't see me game. One night I got this really strange feeling and I woke up to two handprints on my window. I screamed for my dad and saw a shadow of legs and a dog quickly walk away from my windows. My dad went outside to check it out, but he didn't find anything, so he brushed it off as me just worrying and being paranoid. A few years later, my parents are now divorced and I'm around 16. My mom comes in livid, accusing me of smoking cigarettes in the yard and throwing them down in the yard. We walk over to the area and I tell my mother that I don't even smoke and it could be my peeping Tom. She believes me and we install a motion sensor light. Within the next three years before I went to college, we would often find Mountain Dew cans, cigarette butts, and candy wrappers right where my window is. I move away for college and think nothing of it. I thought it was over. Then... In the middle of the night, my 13-year-old little brother calls me crying, saying he would never sleep in my room ever again. He had slept downstairs in my bed because he had missed me, and he woke up in the middle of the night feeling watched. Fast forward around five years, and my boyfriend and I decided to go visit my childhood home. We walk around towards my window so discreetly to share a cigarette, and as I'm telling the story, he freaks out. He bends down and pulls a dry butt from my window sill. It had rained until 12 the night before. I have no doubt that someone in my neighborhood has been watching me for close to 10 years, and they only stopped when they realized I moved. We occasionally find random items near my window, and no one wants to sleep in that room, but can you really blame them? My mom was a single parent of three kids. We were pretty poor, so she worked pretty much 24-7, which meant that as kids, my siblings and I spent a lot of time home alone. Well, the story happened when I was 14 years old. It was the start of summer. My older sister had moved out, and my little brother got sent to stay with my grandpa for the summer, so I was home alone from about 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. every weekday, which I didn't really mind. I spent it playing Neopets or watching awful daytime TV. Well, one day I had not long woken up. My mom had gone to work hours earlier, and it was about 12 p.m. I got up, made myself some food, let my dog outside, and settled out on my bed to eat. So, I'm watching Rock of Love, which is weird because I remember exactly the bit of the show I was watching when this happened, even though it happened so many years ago. I'm now watching it, and I hear a smacking noise on my window. My window has a double window that needed two blinds, two curtains, etc. So there was a tiny gap where you could see through the very middle of them where they didn't quite touch. And that's when I saw a shadow along with a loud bang. I also heard what sounded like logs falling. They were outside my window and they were going to be used for firewood for the winter. So I get up and walk to my window thinking perhaps it's a branch or something hitting my window. When I then see it. A huge handprint left on my window, right where the tiny gap was between my blinds. So obviously I freaked the heck out, and I couldn't even breathe, I was so scared. I called 911 and then called my next door neighbor who was a family friend of ours. He ran over as soon as I said, and that's when he found him. There was a man in his mid-forties running from my backyard into the street up ahead. My neighbor kept him there until the police arrived. When they arrived, I told them what happened, and they looked into the said guy to see if he had a weird past, but nothing came up. He had been dating and living with another neighbor of ours about three doors down from my house for a few months, and when asked what he was doing in my window, he said he was never there and that he was just looking for something in my front yard. The police got a statement from him, the neighbor who caught him, and myself, 
and I thought it would help him get put away or something, but no, they just let him go. I waited to hear back from them regarding the next steps, but I never got a reply from them. From then on, my anxiety was awful. I had some motion lights set up outside my window, as well as making sure I was never sleeping alone, but it wasn't enough. I literally could never rest. I felt like I was constantly being watched because, who knows, I honestly could have been. How did this guy know I would be home alone, and what did he want to find me doing? I just felt so unsafe. Fast forward about two months later, and I'm staying with my best friend who lives across the street from me, and we're in the shower. We then saw a shadow walk up to the bathroom window. It's glazed over, so you couldn't really see anything properly, but I decided to open it up a bit, and who do I see? The guy from my window running away from the bathroom window just as I opened it. I told my friend who it was, and we both freaked out. We called the cops again, and again, they didn't do anything about it. The worst part is no one even believed me, minus the guy who found him the first time. My mom said I was too fat for a guy to want to creep on me and that I was just being dramatic. The worst part is nothing happened to this man. He did this twice to me, but how many others did he do this to? And I'd also like to add that the woman he was living with had a very young daughter at the time. It still haunts me to this day, even though I guess it shouldn't. It just really scares me that we can go on with our lives and someone could be watching us and just waiting to prey on us and we would never know. What would he have done if he didn't slip and get caught? I don't even want to think about it. Back in the early 2000s, around the age of 13, I lived in upstate New York in the town of Rhinebeck. Rhinebeck is an old and fairly sleepy place, all things considered. Our house was high on a hill surrounded by dense woods on all sides except for the street. The home was quiet and incredibly secluded. Our nearest neighborhood was about a quarter mile down a winding and poorly maintained road with only a singular streetlight that was way too dim to offer much visibility. For this story, I'll give you an idea to the layout of the house. It was two stories. The stairs were situated in the middle of the house. Our most common point of entry was through the two-car garage. The front door was to the right of the garage entry, and standing from that door, you could look up to the stairs to your left center and see to the top. At the top of the stairs, my parents' room was on the immediate right. To the left, there was a hallway with two rooms side by side at the very end. Mine and my brother's. My room was situated over the garage. Now for the story. I had always been very on edge about where we lived, as it gave me a sort of Mothman Prophecies kind of vibe. You could hear every twig snap, every coyote and bird. And when it got dark out, well, it was very dark. Late one night, I had long since gone to bed and was jarred awake by a sound below my room. I sat shock still for a moment, listening to the deafening silence before accepting that I'd been dreaming. Just as I started to drift off, I started to hear scratching. It was very slow at first and hard to make out, almost like the sound of metal scraping against slate. It started to become more deliberate and I pinpointed it to the garage door that entered into the house. My first thought was go to my parents. But it occurred to me that if I stood outside their door, I would be easily seen at the top of the stairs should someone get in or already be in. The noise continued, and I finally crawled out of my bed as quietly as possible to lock my bedroom door and then pick up the cordless phone from my desk before bolting back. It had felt like hours had passed by, but I don't know exactly when the scratching came to a stop. By morning, I had just pushed it to the back of my mind as a dream. Sitting around the kitchen the next day, I told my parents about the dream. They looked concerned and, out of curiosity, we went and looked at the garage door, which was a very heavy metal finished door. What we found on the other side were pry marks, as though someone had repeatedly jammed a crowbar into the door frame. I stared in disbelief and I was totally creeped out. My father changed the lock on the outermost door that day. To this day, we still don't know what happened, 
but it really creeps us out. Before I begin this story, I just want to add that I have no prejudice or issues with anyone of Middle Eastern descent. Anything I say is honestly just to describe the people around me and the situation as it happened. My mother and stepfather live in Europe, and I had visited them for Christmas break. I was an undergrad in a large New York City school, so I was flying Frankfurt to JFK. Because I'm highly intelligent, I read my flight time as 11.50, when it was actually 11.05. Cue me dashing through the airport and barely making it on the last bus to the tarmac, which was reserved for people who had to go through a secondary hand search of belongings security check. As I had just barreled my way through a large international airport, I was one of those lucky few. The rest, all Middle Eastern, from families with kids, an elderly woman, and mostly single men. Anywho, I had just barely made it. The bus had closed its doors and was ready to leave, until I came flying out with an out-of-breath German airport agent trailing behind me. I was covered in sweat and quite embarrassed, but thankful that I made it, as the semester had started the next day. I observed my fellow security risks, and noticed a middle-aged man in what I would say is traditional Middle Eastern clothing. He was in a white sort of robe that went down to his ankles and the sleeves to his wrists. He had some headgear on. It appeared to be a cap with an embroidered design that circled fully around his head and barely extended past the top of his skull. I only noticed him and subsequently his clothing because he was on the phone and he was sobbing. Not the quiet sniffle cry that I did when I realized I had messed up the time, but full on hiccuping cries while he talked on the phone. I felt really bad for him. He was speaking in Arabic so I didn't know what was going on, but I could imagine that maybe it was along the lines of him being upset that he might miss his flight as our bus wasn't guaranteed to get to the plane in time. We get on the plane, make our way to our seats, and I'm pretty delighted to find that I'm in the aisle with no one in the middle, and a decently good looking girl in the window seat. The crying man was behind me as we shuffled down the aisles. I noticed that he had no carry-on luggage, but didn't really care. Once I sat down, he kept going, looked around a bit confused, then sat down in the middle of about five unoccupied middle rows. Having myself been shuttled back and forth across the Atlantic many, many times before, I know that was where the flight attendant would set up their sleep area for the rest in between shifts. I was about to tell him that, but AFA swooped in and directed him to the seat on his ticket, which was in the middle row directly behind me. He was still crying, but I cry a lot too, so I don't think much of it. Thankful that I was safely on the plane and heading back to the good old US of A, I settled in and tuned out the welcome video that had started playing. Well, that didn't last very long. The video paused as the FA made the customary greeting to everyone. Taxing begins and I'm on my way back to studiously playing soccer and getting learned. There's a commotion behind me and the man from before then stands up, starts crying harder, sobs and hiccups aplenty and once the FA speech is done he then yells. This lady's lying. This plane isn't going to New York. This dude is scream sobbing in a mixture of English and Arabic. I'm just waiting for us to get up in the air and the drink surface so I can get my, you know, drink on. He graciously slid past the woman in the aisle and then started screaming and gesticulating at the various FAs stationed around. He then utters what every owner of a lily white butt has been conditioned to fear. Allah. To be more specific, New York is a lie. They're lying to us. Allah will deliver us to paradise. There were more pronouncements, but as they were in a mix of English and Arabic, I don't quite remember. Essentially, they were the last freaking thing that you'd want to hear on a plane, whether you're 30k feet in the air or sitting on the tarmac. Judging by the faces of everyone around, they were scared. His shouting was then solely in Arabic. My exhausted and stressed brain could only think. If I just freaking sprinted to get on this plane and then something happens and I die, I'm going to be really outraged. I mean, also I would be dead, but I would still be outraged. Our plane screeches to a halt. Well, 
It slowly rumbles into a plane park, and the German police surround our plane and unceremoniously charge down the aisles. They have body armor and guns all over, and they take him off the plane, and presumably into custody. Due to our proximity to him, the passengers in the rows in front of and behind him were questioned by the police. Me being a member of the bus of public enemies, I got grilled even harder. I told him I'm a stupid American who got my times mixed up, admitted to my sin, got baptized, and I was finally released. We told them that as far as we knew, he had no carry-on luggage, and the agents in the airport said he hadn't checked any baggage. This guy continued screaming various iterations of, This plane isn't going to New York, as he was hauled off in cuffs, which doesn't quite make for a relaxing 10-hour trip. The flight was pretty uneventful afterwards, but there was obvious tension in the air. I have always hated flying, and this certainly didn't help. So, man in the front row behind me that totally freaked out on the plane. I'd really like it if we'd never meet ever again. The following story comes from 2013, when I was making my living as a bartender in a small lounge just off Washington Square Park. Lopez was a Sunday brunch regular that I dreaded seeing every weekend. An elderly Latino man, he was both very gay and very wealthy. Having formerly been a high-ranking employee at the UN, it may seem strange to say, but Lopez was different from your average gay man. He was a special breed. He had been gay since being gay in New York City was dangerous. This has made him tough and pushy. Though Lopez was old and frail in appearance, he was an intimidating bastard in spirit. When he had set his eyes on a target, nothing could frighten him off its trail. I, unfortunately, became that target before even realizing it. I was a tall, broad-shouldered 25-year-old man at the time. My image was the last thing that came to mind when I thought about victim of sexual harassment. That's why it caught me so off guard. At first, Lopez and I made the regular small talk. I told him about myself, he told me about himself, then I served his glass of Albarino and went about my business. Soon however, Lopez began staying through my entire shift and demanding my attention virtually the entire time. He would even go out of his way to frighten off the other regulars I'd chat with. His tone changed, it went from cordial to syrupy sweet. The conversations he'd trapped me in began focusing more and more on past sexual exploits and lovers. That's when he started to make moves. Sometimes I just want to screw you so bad, he'd say, or if I could just see you in a thong. I wasn't about to have this at work, so I told my friend and manager. He blew me off, however, told me Lopez was a nice guy that he'd take really good care of me if I let him. I was shocked by this. When I told the general manager, he went one step further and accused me of being homophobic. At this point, I knew it was up to me to handle this. The next Sunday when Lopez sat at the bar, I looked him dead in the face and said, don't screw with me today. I'm not interested and I will not be harassed. Even while I spoke, Lopez's lips curled into a smile. He was pleased that he had shaken me this much. I felt immediately powerless. The following Sunday was to be my last. I had given notice and told everyone exactly why I was leaving. Lopez has been begging me every week to spend time with him after my shift. That past Sunday, when I had so unsuccessfully tough-talked him, he even waited for me outside. I was not going to let things progress any further. Since this was to be my first stretch of unemployment in a while, I had also decided to take advantage and realize a lifelong desire to visit Brazil. I had purchased tickets, but I'd not yet told anyone at work about these plans. That Sunday came around and went as usual with Lopez sitting at his regular spot, lavishing me with compliments and repeatedly inviting me to his home. To my relief, 
He left well before my shift ended. As I headed home that late afternoon, however, I found myself staring straight into Lopez's face as I rounded a corner. He quickly locked arms with me and began steering me in a different direction. I freaked out immediately and recoiled. He apologized. Hey, I know I give you a lot of crap, but it's all just a tease, you know that, right? He said, and similar things. All of the sudden, Lopez didn't seem so bad. I actually felt a little guilty taking his advances so personally. In this frame of mind, I stupidly agreed to get a drink with him. We went to a brightly colored Mexican restaurant where everyone seemed to know Lopez. The whole group was about his age and definitely represented the leftovers of Greenwich Village's glory days. Things got strange, quickly. A wrinkled old lady in a miniskirt waltzed over and kissed Lopez on the cheek. Then, without even being introduced, slipped her hands in between my legs and began rubbing my upper thigh. When I backed away, she turned to Lopez and said, You need to open this sweet young flower up. Keep in mind, she's talking about a bearded man, adding to the creepiness factor. He smiled at me and replied, Oh, Chi Chi, this one's too young and strong. We have to break him first. The feeling of sitting there and hearing two elderly people talk about me like a sexual favor that was about to be passed around was too much to handle. I got up and left. As I hit the door, and this was by far the worst part, Lopez called after me. Leave now, but who knows what old friends you might just run into in Brazil. To this day, I still have no idea how he knew of my travel plans. I had told no one at my job, none of my other regulars, or anyone I knew that had contact with Lopez. Either way, cue three weeks of me perpetually looking over my shoulder in Rio de Janeiro. Fortunately, my stalker lost interest by the time I returned. But let me just emphasize, Lopez, let's never, ever meet again. I was selling my old car as I had just bought a brand new one. I posted on a couple of selling sites and Facebook. I had arranged two visits that day and I was home alone. It was broad daylight so I assumed everything would be fine. The first one that came made an offer a little lower than what I was looking for, so I said I would get back to him later as I had another viewing. The guy from Facebook pulled up in a blacked out Range Rover and three other guys got out. I opened the car and explained while I was selling it. You know when you just get a bad feeling? I wasn't sure why four people would need to come view an eight-year-old car. He asked if he could take the car for a drive. At this point, I was not going to get in the car with him, so I said, yeah, take it. I'll wait here with your friends. He asked me to get in the car with him, and then he said, What if I took it? Well, it wouldn't really matter. That's what insurance is for. I was not getting in the car with him. The three guys left didn't speak to me, just to themselves, and I couldn't understand but it made me feel very unsure if my car would come back. The car was not worth putting up a fight or arguing over. I was questioning my life choices when he pulled back up. He got out and he offered me the same as the guy earlier that wanted to buy the car for his daughter. He wanted me to get in the car with him to go collect the cash. I said it was fine. If he needed to go, his friends could take him. I had another viewing and I would contact him later. I didn't want to walk back to my house as I had now just decided to sell to the other guy as they were just giving me the creeps. He then offered me more than honestly the car was worth if I went with him right now. I then said no and then I locked the car and started walking towards the main street. I had seen my neighbor walking down the street and then shouted to him and his dog. They spoke to each other and then drove off. I texted the other guy and told him the car was his if he wanted it, and he was welcome to come over any time to get it. He sorted and filled out the V5, and off he went. Later that night, the black Range Rover came back and parked outside. I live in a cul-de-sac, so I'm set back to where it had been. I told my husband, and he looked and said that was strange. Then my phone started blowing up. I politely said that the car is gone and it's now been sold, and that I was sorry but I couldn't help. The car drove off and came back again at about 30 minutes later. 
This happened about three times that night, and I thought it was a bit strange. But I thought nothing more of it as the next few days nothing else happened. On the Friday, four days later, I finished work early, get back, and get the dog ready to go out. We were going to head straight to the park and run like the wind. As I got to the end of the cul-de-sac, the same car pulled up, and one of the guys jumped out and then said hello. I held the leash tighter and my dog was thoroughly unimpressed. She gave a bit of a grumble and he asked if he could pet her. I said no, she's a guard dog and she doesn't like to be touched, and then we went on our way on our walk. He then grabbed my arm and then my dog bit his forearm. He then started screaming. There was only one other guy with him in the car, and then he jumped out and started to shout. This dog is a very calming and loving dog, and to be honest, it was just a warning nip, as if she had really meant to hurt him, she would have gone through the bone. His friend was shouting and pulling him away. I called her back and I got her to sit. A few of my neighbors came outside from hearing all of the commotion, and they went towards the car. I haven't seen the car or those weird guys ever again. And honestly, I don't think I'll sell anything online again. Not if it means strangers have to come to my home to see it. I'll pass. I was at an Irish pub with my girlfriend one Saturday night. We sat at a booth by ourselves and there were a few empty seats there. My girlfriend went to get drinks at the bar and she feels a tap on her shoulder. She looks to her side and she sees a fat, sweaty guy with glasses and the creepiest smile. He has his eyes wide open and he looks at her and says, Hi, how are you? He had quite the uncomfortable presence. We got a sort of delusional stalker vibe from him. She promptly ignores him and heads back to the booth with our drinks. A couple of minutes go by and suddenly the creepy guy proceeds to take a seat in our booth, uninvited. The guy just stares at me with this creepy smile and I get an uncomfortable feeling. I ask him, Um, can I help you? The guy then says to me, I don't believe you love your girlfriend. To which I then reply, Um, yes I do. Who are you to show me you love her? He interruptedly says. I, being a little creeped out, proceed to tell my girlfriend that I love her and give her a kiss in the hopes that this guy would just leave. Nope. The guy just says, that wasn't good enough, show me you love her. I then told him, I don't need to prove to you that I love my girlfriend. To which he then replied, yes you do, show me you love her, show me. At this point I'm more annoyed than creeped out, so I just ignore him, but I stay wary of him. The guy just stares at me for quite a while with this creepy grin, occasionally trying to ask me to prove my love for her. Eventually I just get pissed off, I'm done being polite. I then ask him in an aggressive tone, Look man, can you just leave? Can you leave us alone? He does and he goes to the next booth over, creeping on another poor couple. I decided to go out for a smoke several minutes later and then suddenly the creepy guy appears out in front of me. He had been asked to leave by the bouncers. He just stands there with his creepy smile and tries to hold my hand. The bouncer then came to him and escorted him out. I go back to my booth and I find that a glass had been completely shattered in my seat. Well, the reason the creepy guy had been asked to leave is because he had apparently thrown a glass in the direction of our booth at my seat, thinking I was still sitting there. I wonder what sort of delusional thinking was going on through that guy's head. I'm just glad no one got hurt. So I used to be in foster care and I went to this program that helped foster youth with employment and GEDs. I normally took the bus to go to my customer service class but missed it by a few minutes so I decided to walk. I had done it before with no complications so I didn't think it was a big deal. As I was walking I noticed a young man walking down the street across from me. As he made his way down the sidewalk he was staring at me. He even turned his head to watch me as I passed him so I was feeling pretty creeped out. Anyway, I started to walk faster because I was starting to feel really uneasy, and the building was about an hour or so away. I thought he would just continue walking, but he actually crossed the street to walk on my side of the sidewalk. He then started following me. I decided to call my boyfriend at the time so I would have someone on the phone with me, but he wasn't able to answer. I kept walking, hoping he would eventually just go away and leave me alone. Man, was I wrong. 
I had to stop at a red light, and by this time the man had caught up with me, and he forcefully and aggressively grabbed my butt. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines of, Hey baby girl, how you doing? I felt like I wanted to throw up. I remember getting very angry and spinning around to face him and then say, Get away from me, you freaking creep. Don't touch me. The light turned green and I basically started jogging away from this weirdo. He continued to follow me. I pulled out my phone again to call one of my friends this time and I asked her to stay on the phone with me. There was a small tunnel that I had to walk through coming up and this is where I started to feel really scared because I would no longer be visible to the public and I still had this creepy weirdo following me. After I exited the tunnel, the guy basically ran up behind me and then pinned me against the wall, rubbing his junk against my bottom. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs for him to let me go and squirming around like a fish out of the water before he released me and threw his hands up in defeat before walking away. My friend was on the phone the whole time this happened and then I informed her I was going to call the police. As they were questioning me, they informed me that they've had the same exact incidents reported from multiple different women describing the same man. He was arrested and I'm not sure if he's out now or not because I moved out of state. Thank God. I just moved to a new city. I had a few friends but I still wanted to meet new people and maybe a cute girl to go on a date with. I began using Tinder which I had fun with in other cities. I matched with this gorgeous woman way out of my league. Her profile was funny and pretty interesting. We get to chatting and she's very flirtatious and clever, and she let it drop that she went to a top artsy school in France. So I'm intrigued and also thinking she's out of my league, why she's so interested in me. So I decide to Google her, which is not something I usually do before every date. Usually this will bring up a Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc. But when I clicked to enter, her name came back with like 125k hits, news articles, videos, etc. Chronologically, the weirdness is thus. As a teenager, she was one of those women who would start up correspondence with serial killers and had been engaged to two on death row before they were put to death. And next, she was engaged to her sixth grade teacher in her early 20s. He was apparently famous for having falsely claimed to kill John Benet Ramsey. And lastly, she became a high end escort in this city and had a fairly popular blog all about it. In general, I'm not shaming the sex worker community. But still, it was like sprinkles on the weirdness of this whole thing. After seeing these things, I was intrigued slash creeped out by her, and I also found out that she was the adopted daughter of a local billionaire. I decided this crap wasn't worth it and deleted Tinder the day before our date. Well, the very next day, she messaged me on another dating app, asking me if I was still going to meet her for a drink. Definitely not. I recently moved across the country. For context, I live in a third floor walk up and people can ring our doorbells outside to be buzzed into the building. Unfortunately, it appears that my doorbell broke the day after I moved in. I was bored that night, so I decided to go on Tinder to see if I could find anyone to hang out with. I matched with a guy who we'll call David who opened up with a knock knock. I unceremoniously replied with the obligatory who's there and he responded with this isn't a joke I'm knocking um what I replied yeah this isn't a joke your doorbell's broken I'm knocking to get it in I had only told the maintenance guy about my doorbell not working and this was not him so I spent the rest of my night sitting up in bed holding a knife and watching the door no one ever appeared to have been at the door but I have no idea who they were or how they knew about the bell. So, Tinder Creeper, let's not meet. So, I met a guy on Tinder and we started to really hit it off. We'd been chatting for a few weeks and even discovered we had a few mutual friends as well. I was pretty intoxicated one night and was feeling social and decided to call an Uber to his place. Once I got there, we talked outside for a while, and we ended up vibing even better in person. I opened up to him about my health problems, and he opened up to me about his older sister who had recently passed away from a similar condition as mine. I was curious about his sister, but I definitely didn't want to pry. 
We walked into his apartment and it smelled like literally a thousand rats were rotting under the floorboard. I was still pretty drunk, so I tried to forgive it because, hey, sometimes animals die under a house or in the walls and there's nothing you can really do about it. I started to look around and the whole house just looked like a cluttered storage unit. He takes me to his room, which is seemingly normal, and we hook up. I ended up falling asleep there, and I woke up around 10 a.m. to the stench of death. I opened my eyes, feeling very sober, and started to look around the room. I noticed that only girls' clothes were hung in the closet. I start to assume that I've possibly been cheated with. Then I see a giant black binder on his nightstand. When he woke up, I decided to jokingly ask him, What's in that giant binder? Turns out it was every single episode of Golden Girls printed out. He said that he reads it at work and that it's the only show he'll ever watch. Okay, I asked him what he did for work. Something I definitely should have known by this point. Well, he dodged the question. I sat up and looked at the pillow that I'd been cozily sleeping on. It had no pillowcase and was covered in what looked to be old blood. It looked like the blood had been coughed onto it. I started putting the unpleasant pieces together. I asked as sensitively as I could, Hey, was this your sister's room? I noticed the clothes in the closet. He then says, Yeah, and this is her bed. I haven't changed or washed anything. It just makes me feel better to be in her bed. This is actually where I held her when she died, and you remind me so much of her. I really, really like you and then casually tried to hook up with me like he didn't just drop some crazy news. I felt immensely sorry for him, but I needed to get out of there ASAP. I made some excuse and bounced. I decided not to entirely ghost him because of how bad I felt for him. He was clearly dealing with some pretty dark things. We kept in contact for a few weeks, that is, until I went on my Find My Friends app, and I noticed that he had clearly taken my phone while I was asleep that night, and then shared my location with himself. I called him and I totally went off. This wasn't my first rodeo with a stalker type, and I wasn't going to deal with it again. He told me he couldn't believe I thought he would do that, and that I'm being a really awful person by dumping him because his cat recently died. I blocked him. After he said that about his cat, combined with his tendency to hold on to things, it really makes me wonder what that smell actually was. Let's hope not, and although I hope he gets the help he needs, I really hope I never have the pleasure to meet him ever again. So I had just gotten out of a pretty significant relationship with someone of about four years. Nearly engaged, moving in together, etc. when things fell apart. I took a good amount of time to be on my own and get my things together again when my friends began encouraging me to get back out there. Needless to say, I really wasn't wanting anything at that point, nor looking for anything. But they insisted that I at least just go out on a few casual dates. For practice, I guess. Just to kind of get my skills back up for when I am ready. I think they were honestly just worried because I had become quite hermetic. So I match with this girl who's home from college for the summer. She's a little out of the way from me, but was eager to meet and seemed really interested and was even willing to come to my area. To be honest, I really wasn't all that interested, but again, my friends really encouraged me to do this. You know, practice. A date doesn't mean commitment. Whatever. I wanted to be very clear though that I was extremely honest and explicit with her that I was not looking for anything serious or really anything at all. I was very forthcoming that I had just gotten out of something serious and I was just kind of encouraged to explore. She persisted and still wanted to meet, so we agreed to a casual lunch in a sports bar that week. I get there and she was already waiting for me. I was a bit put off by how much different she looked than in her pictures. Not trying to sound shallow or anything, but her pics from Tinder easily had to be at least 5 years old which I verified based on the tattoos that she had in person versus the ones she didn't in pics. So I was a bit thrown off by that. I wasn't the least bit attracted to her, but I was there to just have new experiences anyway, right? No big deal. 
I felt so bad because the entire time she just seemed so incredibly shy and awkward. I even noticed her hand begin to shake when she reached for her glass, which I found kind of endearing, honestly. So I did my best to get her talking and try to help her feel more relaxed. I asked her questions and chatted about things that I figured you'd chat about on dates. Where she grew up, the music she's into, school she goes to, her major, etc. All to which I really received one word answers. It went on like this for about an hour and she was just not working with me at all. But I tried to keep room in my heart because it was clear she was feeling anxious and I really understood that on a personal level. Then she pulls out this book and says, I got this for you. And I responded very grateful thanking her and inquiring what it was about cause hey, if someone wants to share a good read with me, I'm all for it. She looks at me funny and then says in a very sudden but odd tone, You're kidding, right? I'm very confused and just kind of look at her like, uh, what? And then she says, This is your favorite book. You told me this was your favorite book, right? To which I then said, Um, no, I've never even heard of this before. So we then concluded that she ultimately got me confused with someone else she must have been chatting with which I honestly found kind of hilarious. She was pretty embarrassed, but I made light of it and said that I found it funny because I get it. That's just tender culture, I guess. So as we finished lunch and I'm still receiving one word answers despite our funny movement, I kind of become a bit suggestive that we should conclude our date by saying that I had to get back home to feed my animals and do some laundry. But she became very adamant on spending more time and asked if we could do something else. Now, I was genuinely trying to be a decent person, so I agreed, and we found a nearby park to go walk at. That's where crap gets weird. We sat on a park bench, mind you, it's broad daylight. There's kids playing basketball nearby and folks jogging around. I start trying to make conversation yet again, but still get the one-word answers. Then out of nowhere, without any warning whatsoever, she proceeds to just kiss me very aggressively tongue and everything. I was honestly so shocked and I just stood there frozen, not really knowing what the heck to do. I had this timid shy woman who's not really made much conversation with me at all, who was so nervous that she was visibly shaking, who just turned into a freaking bear mauling my face in like 6 seconds. My head was spinning with confusion and anxiety and I swear it felt like it lasted forever and I just prayed for it to stop. I was so put off and honestly a bit afraid to do or say anything. Like, what do you even do in that situation? I was just hoping she'd pick up on my very obvious body language that I wasn't reciprocating anything at all. I was completely unprepared for a situation like this. Then some really nasty guy walks by gawking and catcalling and literally begins propositioning us into a three-way. And I'm just like, what the heck is going on? I need to get out of here. I was a thousand different types of uncomfortable at this point, and I wanted to leave right away. I end up managing to ward him off after telling him no very politely a few more times. All the while she's just laughing and I'm just sitting here thinking, who even are you? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde over here. Like what the heck? So the weird guy finally leaves and I'm now insisting that I need to leave and go home. She seems to ignore what I'm saying and gets very close to my face again and then says, so, did you like the kiss? Do you think I'm sexy? Do you want me? I was so freaking nervous. I told her that I really needed to go home, and then she asked if she could come along with me. I told her very firmly no, and she literally tried to persuade me to let her come back to my place with me. I had to say no to her about three times. So, finally I'm home and frankly just kind of shaken up from this whole experience. I hadn't really done the dating thing in quite a long time, but that just felt very abnormal. She then texts me after she gets home and asks me out on a second date. I was actually very kind to her despite being made incredibly uncomfortable. I told her I thought she was a very cool chick and I had a nice time but that I didn't feel anything there and reminded her that I wasn't looking for anything. She then blew up my phone with a bunch of crazy messages totally freaking out. She was saying how she didn't understand and was so confused that she thought I was into her and that things went great. I didn't respond to any of these messages because she's now continuing to cross my boundaries. I said what I needed to say and I thought I was being decent by at least being honest about it. 
So the text messages continued and I figured they were eventually going to stop because it was a first date. How can someone be so upset over someone not reciprocating on a first date? They didn't stop. By the text, you would have thought we just ended a two-year relationship. She eventually began calling me now. I had enough and I decided to block her. So Nightmare Tinder Girl, please, for the love of everything, don't contact me ever again. Please. I was 21, recently became a police officer, and was also recently dumped. One of my friends suggested Tinder. As a 21-year-old and a new cop, I had the I'm invincible and I can take on anyone mentality. I matched with a very good-looking out-of-league female. We chatted and eventually set up a date to meet. She said she had a great open field to look at the stars and hang out, and we could meet up at her house. So the night came and I was excited, and she seemed to be excited when I picked her up. She guided me to the field and it looked nice. Open space, woods, deer and other wildlife, etc. In the field I noticed really dim headlights in the distance. Then the van started driving towards us and pulled up in front of us, almost close enough to block me from going forward. I told her to stay in the car and I'll go say hi. I grabbed my flashlight that I had in the car and I began to walk up to the van. In the front driver's side of the van, there was a decently sized man there. I asked him what's going on and if he could back up his car a little bit. He was very polite and said he was the owner of the property and that he didn't mean to scare us. He told me he's been having trouble with poachers on his property and just wanted to make sure we weren't going to be shooting at anything. I ensured him that we only came out to look at the stars and wildlife. He was perfectly okay with that and told me to have a nice date and then drove away. After that, the girl was texting nonstop. Around an hour later, I saw headlights coming towards us again, this time at a really fast pace. We hopped in the car and I moved to a more defensive position. The very same man came close enough to almost hit my car. She hopped out of the car at that point and ran towards the guy. I immediately knew I was screwed. I got out of the car and then gave them commands to back the heck up and get on the ground. Neither of them complied, obviously. The guy then proceeded to charge me and knock me to the ground. Luckily, I was able to get him on his back and then get up. I saw that my date grabbed a metal pipe from the van. She told me they had a gun and to give them my money and truck and I won't get hurt. Of course, with my whole I'm invincible mentality, I said no. She started to cry and saying they didn't want to hurt me. He then started to go back towards the car. At that point, I had enough. I told them I was a cop, drew my concealed firearm, and told them to lay on the ground. After a moment of shock from all of us, they complied. I was able to call 911, tell them my name and badge number, and that I had two at gunpoint and needed backup immediately. I gave the dispatcher the best directions I could give to this field. While on the phone, they both fled. Again, stupid new cop young guy mentality. I chased after them. I took off after the man who ran into the woods around the field. I chased him for maybe 30 seconds and heard three loud pops and saw muzzle flash. My invincible mentality went right out the window. I ran like crazy back towards my car and peeled the heck out of there. I went back to the area that I picked her up in, called dispatch again, and had officers come to that location. Of course, the first officers to pull up was my sergeant and my field training officer. Of course, they were both completely understanding and they didn't give me any crap about it at all. The most used words were calling me dumb and calling me a rookie. I hopped in their car and went towards the field. Luckily, the van was still there. I was told to shut my mouth and only come out if they start getting shot at. They then cleared the area and started looking in the van. They then got inside and searched the van. What scared me the most was when my field training officer and sergeant came back to the patrol car. They let me out and told me to come look in the back of the van. Both of them were pale, looking totally creeped out. I went to the back of the van, where there were several knives, duct tape, lighter fluid, and a decent amount of rifle ammunition, also handcuffs, and what looked to be dried blood. In the front seat passenger side, we found an AR-15 style rifle and two more handguns. 
We called for immediate backup and detectives. When they investigated the blood, it turns out it wasn't actually blood. The plates in the van were reported stolen. I still get crap from my fellow officers about that whole encounter, but luckily no one got hurt. I will never use online dating again. Ever. The story begins with a plain evening scrolling through Tinder and swiping right on the people I found interesting slash cute. One of the matches I got started immediately talking to me. This person was fairly good looking and, I mean, he seemed normal at first. He happened to go to the same university as I did. He was an engineer student and I was a designer student and we had the same campus. As far as I knew, we hadn't met before. We were talking a lot that evening. I was bored so of course I had time to talk to him. I found out he also went to the same gym as I did which was the school gym at our campus. I was surprised I didn't recognize him since the gym was small and usually you start recognizing people there right away. The next day he messaged me and I didn't notice the message right away so he had messaged me twice during the two hours. I didn't think much of this at the time but now I realize they were the first signs of him being a bit pushy. You'll understand later on. I thought that maybe he was a bit too excited to talk to me. The day was a bit busy for me, so I wasn't able to message him as actively as the day before. He seemed a bit bummed about it, but I thought everything was still fine. A couple of days go by. I suddenly get a message from him complimenting my butt at the gym. First of all, I didn't even see him at the gym. Maybe I didn't recognize him. Second, why the heck would he have gone a few days without messaging me, then message me crap like that? And third, just what the heck? Well, obviously I was a bit weirded out by this message, and I really didn't know what to say. For him though, my replies didn't seem good enough because I didn't like his message. He kept sending the weird messages and started saying inappropriate stuff like, Maybe tomorrow you could squat and I could watch you. In my mind, this normal guy just suddenly turned into this weirdo, and I wasn't sure what this behavior was, as he'd never behaved like this before. I told him I didn't appreciate this behavior. His replies started getting more and more passive-aggressive, and they just kept saying that he wanted to meet, and he was really pushy about it. I had enough. I decided to delete him as a match. He was just way too weird for me. About a year goes by, or I don't know, maybe even more than a year. I don't remember exactly, but I remember the moment when I got a random message on WhatsApp from an unknown number. It was a plain hello with some emojis. I replied to this person asking who he was. He said his name, but at first I didn't realize that this person was the same creepy guy from over a year ago on Tinder. I asked him where he got my number, and he claimed that I had shared it with him on Tinder a year ago. Like what? I don't share my phone number that easily, so no way. I stopped replying to him because I also recognized him from his profile picture, and I realized that this guy was the same creep that was talking to me over a year ago. I screenshotted the conversation and the creep's photo to my friends, and basically shared my feelings of how weirded out I was about him. Well, it got even creepier. One of my friends happened to know him. Let's just say that the creepy dude from Tinder did some unspeakable things to her, and I was next. So in conclusion, this guy searched for my number, tried to lie about how he got it, and was talking to me after being rejected a year ago. I was so creeped out about this that I decided to tell my father all about this guy. I gave my dad his number, and I haven't heard from this creep ever again since. I think my father told him to back off, but I'm not sure how and in what way. But to be honest, I don't really care. I'm just glad that creep isn't trying to approach me anymore. I decided to switch gyms after this incident and also happened to graduate as well. Thank God. I'm not really sure if I would recognize him on the street or in person. I'm just really glad I never actually met him. He was a total creep. So yeah, anything can happen when messing around on Tinder. Be careful when looking for your match. You never really know who you'll match with, or who they'll turn out to be. Keep in mind, this story happened over the span of only one month and a half, and everything happened quite quickly. 
for some context, my name will be Cat, his name will be John, and his mom's name is Karen. This is a story I've only ever told a handful of people, and I'll try to be as clear and accurate as I can, as this happened just over a year ago, but obviously I can't remember everything verbatim. And I know, I made a lot of mistakes, and I'll probably mention it a few times, but honestly I've criticized my own decisions a million times over, and it's not really useful to think about what I could have done differently, so please be respectful in the comments. Okay, so here's the story. About a year ago, I had just gone through a really bad breakup. He dumped me over text on Valentine's Day. And after having been together for quite a while, this was quite a shock for me. I was absolutely devastated, and I felt pretty bad about myself. It only took about two weeks before I was looking for another boyfriend. More or less a rebound guy. Don't judge me. That's when I met John. We met on Tinder and instantly hit it off. I was in my first year of university studying biology and he was in his first year studying history. He was smart and friendly and had a lot of common interests as me. He was giving me some weird vibes, but maybe it was that he just seemed a bit desperate. But honestly I was too after my bad breakup, so I didn't think much of it. After only a few days of talking, he asked me to go on a date with him to a play. I was so excited because that was such an interesting date idea and I thought it would be pretty romantic. We go on the date, and it goes well. He rides the subway back a few stops with me, and I tell him about my ex. He tells me that he can't believe anyone would let a pretty girl like me go, and that he would do anything to make sure he kept me if he was dating me. Now, having read the title, you can see just how creepy that statement actually is. But I guess I was just naive or just happy that someone agreed that my ex wasn't a good guy and I took it as a compliment and I didn't really see anything wrong with it at the time. We continued to message and going on occasional dates after this. All was well. After a few dates, John had told me he had really bad depression and anxiety. Now, it's important for me to mention that I also have some pretty extreme depression and mental health problems as well and my breakup had kind of launched me into a downward spiral. So it was almost a relief to hear him say that because I felt like he wouldn't judge me for having depression as well. After that, we would always confide in each other about our depression and help each other get out of bad mental states. After this revelation, we got really close, really fast. We had only dated for about a month, but we already had a very intense relationship. I even thought that I loved him. Now, another problem with him was his mother, Karen. She was very possessive of him, and maybe it's because of his depression, but he couldn't do anything without telling his mother first. She was very possessive of him. Maybe it's because of his depression, but he couldn't do anything without telling his mother about it first. One night he fell asleep at my place, and he forgot to set an alarm, and when he woke up he had 10 missed calls and around 50 messages from his mom trying to find him. She had apparently called every hospital in town looking for him. She knew he was going to spend the night, she was just concerned I guess because he slept 2 hours later than he said he would. She would do other things as well to try to manipulate him, like verbally abuse him or tell him he's a bad son if he doesn't do everything she wants, and she even set limits to how often and when he could come to my place. I wasn't happy with this, obviously. I told him that I thought it was ridiculous that she treated him like a child, and that he's an adult and can do whatever he wants and go on dates whenever he wants. If she wants to know where he is, that's fine, but he shouldn't have to ask for permission. We had a small argument about it, but he was obviously a mama's boy, so I just decided to drop it. At this point, I still hadn't even met his mom, so who was I to really judge? Another thing I'll mention is that one time he had asked me to do roleplay with him, in which I wear glasses and call him specifically Sweetie. He was very clear that he wanted me to call him that. He told me that it was a teacher fetish. I told him I really wasn't into that kind of thing, I'm sorry. He asked a few more times and never really dropped it, but I always said no. 
This will be important to the story later on. After one particular bad night, he came over to console me, and I told him I was feeling pretty depressed. And his response? He asked me to marry him. This was only after just one month of dating. I laughed, thinking he was joking, but he didn't laugh. He just stared me in the eyes. There was an awkward silence, and I just said, What? And then he said, I'm serious. I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I laughed and gave him a firm no. He looked disappointed but dropped it. I was kind of concerned about this and confided in my friend and she said if it were her she would dump him. I thought it was quite strange but I really relied on the emotional support that he gave me and I was very emotionally fragile at the time so I decided I'd just pretend it didn't happen. I'd like to mention that I know I made mistakes and I ignored the obvious red flags, but when I was with him he often implied or even stated that I was way too mentally unwell or unattractive to get anyone else better than him, and he also said other manipulative things as well that made me feel like breaking up with him would be really bad for me. He would often make comments about how he would hurt himself if I ever broke up with him and it would be my fault. Yeah, he was a really great guy but I thought I loved him. After a few days later, I went to his place for the first time ever. He lived with his parents, so when his mom got home from work, I of course introduced myself. She seemed very skeptical of me and wouldn't even shake my hand. She gave me a fake smile and said hi. Then she started focusing all of her attention onto John. Hi sweetie, how's it going? She said, giving him a really big kiss on the lips. Yeah. She also wore very similar glasses to him and continued to call him sweetie all night. That was basically the only thing she ever called him. Sound familiar to anything else I mentioned? Yeah. I was very much creeped out, but I kept my mouth shut. His mom never spoke to me, only really ever talking to me if it was necessary, and I got a very weird vibe off of her. I had only gone to her house and met her willingly one time more after this, and it went basically the same, except this time I was doing homework, and she kept making comments about how I was stupid because I couldn't do my homework on my own if I ever took a break to talk to John about something. I tried to argue with her, and she would call me names, but John just shut us both down, and we all moved on. His dad also lived there, but mostly didn't say anything and just lurked around in the background, not really saying much or just staying in the basement. So he's not really important to the story, just an interesting detail. Fast forward a few days. I was still talking to John, but I think he sensed I was growing distant from him. I get a text from John very late at night telling me he was suicidal and that he really needed me. I had a midterm the next day and I told him I'm sorry I can't be there and that I needed some sleep and to be at school in the next morning for my midterm. He was very upset, however, so I suggested he go to the hospital and I told him I can meet him there after my midterm. He didn't respond. After a half hour, I get a text from him. He tells me he's outside my residence building and his mom drove him there. I told him again that I couldn't go to his place. He says that it's okay, and that he just wanted to talk. I eventually give in, and go outside to meet him, and go for a walk. He starts walking me in the direction of the parking lot. I get a bad feeling in my stomach. I don't know why, but I just felt scared. I say, why don't we walk this way, and try to turn and go the other direction, and he just says, No, it's fine and grabs my arm really tightly. I don't know what else to do, so I just say, John, you're making me really uncomfortable. Why are you taking me to the parking lot? He didn't respond and just kept walking me in silence. I try to pull my arm away from him, but he has a really tight grip on me. John, I said loudly. He then says, It's okay, chill out. John, let me go home, I say firmly pulling my arm. There was no one else around to help me. I was scared. I really don't think you want to do that. 
he says in an emotionless tone. What? Yes, I do. I want to go home. I'm about to cry at this point. I was just so confused and scared. He starts explaining. Listen, Kat. My mom is in the driveway, and if you don't get in the car soon, she's going to call the police and tell them you're suicidal. The police will come here and cause a scene, and then hold you against your will. Do you really want that? My brain started going a million miles a minute. I lived in university residence, and I really, really didn't want the police to pick me up where everyone could see me and cause an awful scene. I also had been to the hospital before, and my school had warned me of possible repercussions if I tried to harm myself on campus again, which he reminded me of. I was really confused and I felt betrayed. However, quickly weighing the pros and cons in my head, I thought supporting my boyfriend when he needs me and not causing a scene would be the easiest thing to do, still not realizing why he was doing what he was trying to do. I tell him I'm not happy and that he's blackmailing me and that I don't want to be with him if he's going to treat me this way. But the threats just continue, so I go to his car. I get there and there she is, his evil mother Karen, with the most disgusting ugly smirk I'd ever seen on her face. I was just about to call the police, she says. John stands beside me as I get in the back of the car and he gets in the front. She starts to drive. As the shock began to wore off, I then realized I was super pissed off. I start yelling that they're trying to manipulate me and I go off on Karen for manipulating her son and being a bad mother and then going off on him for being a bad boyfriend. Meanwhile, Karen is screaming at me that I'm a slut and a bad girlfriend and that I should just end my life because I'm such a bad influence for her son. And we have one of the most intense arguments I've ever had in my life. I hate confrontation and I honestly didn't know I was capable of so much rage. But fear and adrenaline does crazy things to people. Karen then pulls over the car. Get out, she says. I lunge at the door ready to run away. But I will call the police on you. I hesitate. Who do you think they'll believe? A reliable older lady with a respectable job? Or a slutty little autistic hood rat like you? Especially with your history of mental health. And then she starts laughing like a maniac. The situation really dawned on me. I couldn't leave. While I hesitated to think, hand still on the door handle, she escalated her threats from telling the police I was suicidal to telling the police and my school that I assaulted her and her son after he tried to break up with me. And even though the car was parked and the door was unlocked, I couldn't leave. She then said, In my car, you don't get to talk to me like that. So either be civil and quiet or get the heck out of my car. John stayed quiet throughout this whole car ride, not defending himself or his mother and not helping me, just stone cold and expressionless. I started sobbing and crying and begging her to please let me go, which she then said, You have every right to leave. Get out if you want to go. I felt like I had no options, so I swallowed my pride and apologized to disgusting Karen and let myself get driven to their house. I tried texting my friend what was going on, but she wasn't answering. Once we get there, it's like 1 or 2 in the morning. I wasn't really sure because, of course, my phone had died. Great timing. Karen had been taunting me and making fun of me the whole way home, and I wasn't even able to defend myself after her new threats. I was still crying, and John helped me out of the car. He held onto me as I went inside. I'm not really sure if it was because he wanted to get me in quickly, or because I could barely move. I was crying so hard. But they kept shushing me, and Karen raised her hand as if to slap me if I didn't shut up. Her words. So I stifled my tears until we got inside. Once we got inside, John brings me straight to his room. He asks if I want to watch a movie, but I just lay down on his bed and sobbed. He sits beside me and touches my arm in what would have been a comforting way under a different circumstance. I pull away from him, and he just quietly watches videos and occasionally tells me that this was for the best how I couldn't hurt myself as long as he was protecting me, and now we could both be safe together. 
his dad was home, but the whole time everything was happening, he said nothing to me and only came into John's room one time to give me a strange look and then leave. He was a weird guy. John's mom came in a while later and told me to sit up and stop crying, saying that this was for the best for me and John, and that she's only doing this because she cares about us. I don't have anything to say to her, so I just pet her dog and don't make eye contact. She berates me and insults me, with no reaction other than a few snide comments from me that John would tell me were uncalled for, followed by more tears and silence. And then she started going after me for petting the dog. Why don't you make eye contact? What are you, autistic? Then proceeds to call me a retard and other slurs. And what really makes this even more disgusting is her respectable job is that she works with disabled teenagers. I ignore her, and then she starts saying really hurtful things. Now, I can take an insult, but she crossed the line when she started talking about how my mother was abusive, and how I deserved it, and she can see why I was abused. Now, it's true, my mother may have been abusive, but she really crossed the line. She had no right to talk about that, and John had no right to tell her about that. That was my business. She then went on to say that she was a much better mother, and I should be grateful that she's doing this for me. The whole time I was there, she kept implying that this was in some sick way supposed to help me. I feel like I was only there for John to have someone with him, though. I absolutely lost it at the comments about my mom, though, and I started yelling at her about how she's abusive and way worse than my mother, and that I hate her, and we would have a drawn-out screaming match for a really long time. And again, John doesn't defend me. He just says that I should listen to his mom. After more insults and yelling, she storms off, and it's just me and John. And I tell him I'm breaking up with him and that I want to leave right now. He goes to get his mom, who says I'm just having a rough night and don't mean it, and we both should just get some rest. John gives me pajamas to wear, and I get dressed in his closet and go to bed. He was sleeping beside me. I wasn't afraid John was going to hurt me, and don't worry, he didn't. Not physically, at least. But I was still uncomfortable sleeping beside him because I felt so betrayed and scared, and I even felt violated. I wanted to leave more than anything. I felt like an animal in a cage. I then got up and bolted to the front door, only for him to run behind me and then grab me and have Karen block my way. I started screaming. Let me go, please, I'm sorry, let me go. I was sobbing and was trying to be as clear as I could through my tears. Karen just looked at me like I was the most disgusting thing she had ever seen in her life and then scoffed at me. Grow up, she said and walked off. John brought me back to his room and locked his door. His mom came back after he let her in a few minutes later and she said she had some kind of pill to help me sleep. I absolutely refused to take it. She kept insisting, and I kept saying no. I'm not trying to poison you, I'm trying to help you. Just take it. She kept shouting, but I didn't trust that crazy woman. John took one first to prove that they were safe, and it was pretty clear after over an hour of arguing and John taking one, I wasn't going to have much of a choice. I only pretended to take one at first, but this psycho checked my mouth and made sure I actually took it. She basically shoved one in my mouth after she realized I didn't take the other one. After a while, I felt very, very tired and fell asleep. I still don't know what she gave me, but it tasted awful, and it was the kind to dissolve under my tongue. She had them in a clear plastic baggie with no label on it. I woke up the next morning and John and his mom were both in the kitchen eating breakfast. I saw my chance. I was finally alone. I got dressed super fast and I found my phone where he had hidden it, still not charged. It had my fare card for public transport in the case though, so I pocketed my phone and quickly snuck out through the front door. Nothing had ever been so intense for me before. I put on my shoes really quick and opened the door and freaking ran. I ran like the freaking wind, on the verge of tears and shaking. I had never ran so fast before in my life. I didn't know the neighborhood, and I didn't know how to get home, but I needed to get away, and fast. I have no idea if they chased me or not, or if they even noticed right away. The dog stayed quiet. I found a bus stop, and I get on the first bus that shows up. I pull out my card and tap it, 
and it didn't have any money on it. My brain just buzzed. I had no way to get home. I needed to get on this bus, and I had to get away. The bus driver shrugged and said you should have the money. Meanwhile, I was still just staring at my card. Then I just started sobbing, and I practically fell over. I was crying so hard. I tried to explain to the bus driver what was happening, but I was crying so hard and talking so fast that I made no sense. The bus driver just said to me, Whoa, are you okay? And I just told him no, and started crying harder. He just quietly handed me a transfer, and I thanked him and sat down really quickly, noticing everyone staring at me. I just put my hood up and cried quietly. I still didn't know how to get home, but I realized the bus was going to a subway station and even though it was a long ride, I could get home from the station. As soon as we got there, I ran onto the subway, still crying and shaking. I probably looked like quite the sight. The subway eventually got to my school, and then I realized I couldn't go home. John knew where I lived, and God, he could have gone to the police. I didn't know what to do. I saw someone with a phone charger and ran over and asked if I could please charge my phone and that it was an emergency. Typical millennial me didn't know my friend's phone number. I charged my phone, face covered in tears and probably smudged mascara, and immediately texted my friend. I had told her right before my phone died that John and Karen wouldn't let me leave their car, and she had sent me quite a few messages and had apparently tried to come to my house to look for me too. I told her where I was, and I asked her if I could go to her place. I got many messages from John as well. John tried saying he tried to kill himself and that he really needed me, that I needed him, and that I'm making a huge mistake. Absolutely anything and everything to try and make me respond. Now, you guys will probably judge me for this, but I decided to go and visit him in the hospital. I don't know why after all that that I decided to do this, but I did. After I got to the ER, his mom then told the nurse that I was also threatening suicide, and that I needed to be put on suicide watch too. The nurses took me aside and asked me, and of course I said no, and I was legally an adult so they couldn't take Karen's word over mine, and they didn't hospitalize me. I told John we were over and I hope he gets better soon, but he was really mad at me. He said that his mom told him how I was suicidal and how she said that she heard the nurses talking to each other about how I was lying to get attention and all this other BS. I tried to defend myself to him, but I just left defeated, gave Karen the middle finger and literally ran the heck out and never looked back. I crashed at my friend's place and slept on her floor for a week. A little while later, I got a text from one of John's friends, basically insinuating that he took his life and it was all my fault. And I told the guy that after that, what the family did to me, and they can all go to hell and to never message me ever again, and blocked the number. To this day, I have no idea if John is alive or not. Also, you might have noticed that I didn't call the police. I did speak to a police officer about it eventually, and my concerns about Karen would be more reliable than me and I didn't have much evidence. They said if I want, I could file a report, but I honestly never did. I wanted absolutely nothing to do with them anymore. To those who want to say I wasn't actually kidnapped because I wasn't tied up or anything, which someone has said to me before, I may have been allowed to leave physically, but emotionally they made me feel like I didn't have a choice to stay, and they did drug me, so I don't know. So to John, but mostly Karen. I really pray and hope I never meet either of you ever again. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you have your own personal scary story, be sure to submit that to my subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash southern cannibal or to my email at southerncannibal at gmail.com. I'm always looking for new stories. And before we bring this video to a close, I just want to shout out all of my $5 or more patrons, as well as my $3 or more patrons featured on screen. Shout out to Babe Lincoln, Beth A, Kate E, Katrina T, Celeste S, Ellie S, Emily W, Heather B, Howard R, 
Jazzy G, Jonathan C, Joseph F, Lori J, Matthew B, Michael G, Steph L, Tammy S, Terry H, Too Ecky For You, and Victor R. Thank all of you so much for supporting me on Patreon. I really appreciate it more than you know. And if any of you would like to join these awesome people and also become a patron, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash southerncannibal. Thank you everyone, and have a good one. And remember to always stay.